Dear friends and colleagues, a warm welcome from Brussels and the European Movement International. Uh, I am Petros Fasoulas, I'm the Secretary General of the EM International, and today I will be the moderator of a very interesting discussion that we have organized. We want to look at the challenges that the rule of law and democracy in general is facing in specific member states, but across Europe as well, both inside the EU and outside. Uh, those of you who are close observers of uh, the work of the European Movement are familiar with uh, our efforts in both making our democracy more inclusive, but also taking the necessary steps to highlight challenges to our democracy and uh, bring together an alliance of stakeholders from civil society, politics, EU institutions, the national level, to, to strengthen it and ensure that it flourishes in the future. And in this context, we decided to organize today's discussions, to bring together voices from politics, but also from civil society, from a variety of uh, countries, to look at the specific situations in their jurisdiction, but also to discuss how all this is affecting the European Union as a whole. Uh, and for that reason, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have with me three distinguished members of the wider European movement family and close partners of our organization. Uh, first, we have uh, Marcin Swiecewski, who is the president of the European movement Poland. Uh, he's a long-standing activist, but also a politician and a political operator that has been working with us, the European movement, for a long time. Marcin, thank you for joining us. Uh, with him, we have Beatrix Bensur, who is the president of the European Values Association in Hungary, uh, a new organization whose uh, purpose is to uh, bring together alliance of stakeholders to discuss the challenges that European values are facing in Hungary and connect them with the European level. Bea, thanks a lot for, for joining us also. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have Vladimir Medek, who is the vice president of the European movement Serbia. Also a commentator, a writer, a, an activist, a campaigner in Serbia, who is currently one of the leading voices for the European movement. Uh, later on in our discussion, we'll also be joined by two members of the European Parliament who have been very vocal in this area, but we thought it's important to start the discussion with you. You are the ones who are closest to the ground. Uh, you are the ones who are facing day in and day out the challenges that the rule of law is currently encountering. And no more so than in a country like Poland, which um, has been in the headlines uh, for a variety of reasons recently, not least because of the crisis at the border with Belarus, but also in the past uh, few months and years because of um, uh, the judicial reviews that have the judicial reforms that have been taking place and have been falling foul to EU values and uh, EU treaties. Martin, perhaps I can start with you and, and ask you to give us a bit of an overview of where we are right now in this uh, uh, standoff between the current government in Warsaw and the European Union with regards to uh, reforms uh, undertaken in, in the judicial sector, but also elsewhere. Yes, thank you very much for, for this invitation. Uh, so uh, this uh, present government uh, took over in 2015 um, and it started immediately with uh, some uh, attack on the Constitutional Tribunal, on judiciary, Mm, uh, under the uh, slogan that the uh, uh, Constitutional Tribunal makes uh, things impossible. Impossibility was, 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 a, was a slogan. In, in, the, in this uh, uh, fight, the, the, first of all, the, the, they refused to nominate the president of the country, refused to, to hand over nominations to uh, correctly selected uh, Constitutional Tribunal judges. And in this place, they selected new judges. We call them doublers. And this is already the, the contested by, by uh, European institutions. Then there was a, 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 a enormous change in the main organ that is um, governing all the judiciary, uh, uh, preparing uh, judges for nomination, uh, 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 promoting judges, Etc. in all levels, so-called National Judiciary Council. And this National Judiciary Council is composed of 25 members, of which 15 were always selected by judges themselves. 
So judges had a majority in this council and uh, rep representative of judges were selected by judges. But in the constitution, it was not written exactly not that they are selected by judges. And the new law was introduced that these 15 representatives of judges are selected by parliament. So majority in parliament selected their judges. Some of them were not even performing those functions, but were, were, were employed by the Minister of Justice. So uh, the institution that is proposing judges for Supreme Court, uh, for uh, other courts, the promotion of judges in, to appeal courts, etc., uh, began to be fully under political control of the present government, in particular by, by, the, by the Minister of, of Justice. Then there was attack on the Supreme Court, and uh, they, they were trying to reorganize Supreme Court and to send to retirement um, uh, one third of the judges of the Supreme Court uh, by changing uh, uh, retirement age that for Supreme Court judges were, 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 were higher than usual, and it was their choice if they would like to continue after the regular retirement age, they could do this, but they wanted to, to eliminate this 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 privilege and to send to retirement uh, all judges that pass the retirement age this didn't work this was stopped with also thanks to intervention of um, uh, european union uh, one of the institutions of european union but nevertheless there is enormous pressure on uh, the supreme court and they reorganized the supreme court establishing a new disciplinary chamber uh, fully filled with new judges selected already by this new uh, national council of, 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 of judiciary and this disciplinary chamber began to to monitor uh, not uh, judges but not only from the point of view of, of, of their uh, behavior i don't know crimes or whatever but also regarding their uh, uh, decisions taken by by by, by judges the rulings of, of of the judges uh, and those judges that somehow did not comfort the government were were were, were reviewed very clearly all the record what, what can be find found to 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 put them into the disciplinary uh, chamber some judges were already uh, removed from 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 the profession some were suspended some were moved to 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 other uh, from, from appeal courts for example to regular courts etc so this disciplinary chamber elected by politicized national council of judiciary became to to make uh, i mean <laughs> order in 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 uh, uh, judiciary uh, and and all these developments uh, uh, finally led to, to, to the big conflict with the European Union. There was a, Article 7 was uh, um, activated against uh, the composition of, of Constitutional Tribunal. Uh, Article 7 that the um, that, uh, country can be somehow um, uh, named as a, a risky from the rule of law point of view or even can face uh, some kind of sanctions uh, regarding voting rights or regarding uh, financial disbursement. Uh, but it requires decision of the uh, council um, and uh, with a very high um, uh, qualitative majority. So, so it, it's not realistic that council will vote four fifths to declare Poland a, a country of great risk or unanimously uh, to, to uh, uh, in, impose on Poland some kind of personal sanctions or voting sanctions or, or financial we can, we can indeed look at the mechanisms at the disposal of the EU to deal with those challenges, but I think the picture you have been painting is obviously a concerning one and it has been um, clear that the intention of uh, the government, the current government, is to, to compromise the independence of the judiciary. And, and in that in that regard, I think uh, we see the real uh, challenge to the rule of the law and democracy at large, because without an independent judiciary, uh, democracy can not really function. If I may, I'll I'll bring in Bea also because there are parallels uh, here, not least because uh, Poland and Hungary have been recently challenging also the, the the primacy of EU law. 
but I can we can touch upon this a little bit. But perhaps, Bea, you know, building on what uh, Marcin have said, can you sketch for us a little bit the, the situation at the moment in Hungary and the challenges that the rule of law is facing in your country? Yes, of course. Um, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here in this uh, panel. Um, I think the subject is, is a very, very uh, interesting and hot one uh, at the moment. And in Hungary, there are um, serious violations of the EU law, just as, as we can hear about it every day in the, in the media. Um, I just heard that today it was a, a decision of the European Court of Justice that this is the so-called Stop Soros, Stop Soros um, um, let's say, campaign um, was found absolutely anti-EU law. Uh, which means that together now at the moment there are 58 infringements against Hungary. Um, this is also one of them. Uh, and these uh, infringements include criminalizing people from civil society um, who are trying to help asylum seekers. Um, but it also includes um, like the civil society uh, members um, we are not in a very, very um, fortunate position at the moment in Hungary with civil society. Um, the government is constantly challenging us. It is hard to reach, um, to, to get access to fundings. And um, well, it is not easy. For example, in our case, in the um, European Values Association, we decided to establish the association and it took us over a year to establish the association itself um, whilst for some other foundations, it only took for three days. So um, there is uh, indeed a violation of, of, uh, of EU values, which we find very, very important to, to step up against them. So um, obviously the situation now in Hungary is a very delicate one because we have the elections upcoming next spring. So um, a lot of people and a lot of organizations are kind of like tiptoeing around because this time, um, since the Fidesz is a party leader, so the Fidesz is the country leader, this time there is a real chance to, to uh, have somebody else maybe um, as a governing uh, body from, from April. So this is a very interesting question. Um, yeah. We've seen in Hungary also efforts uh, not just to limit the role of, of civil society uh, through the measures that you mentioned, the, the Soros legislation, but also uh, to co-opt perhaps the independent media, uh, but, but also to undermine uh, the ability of uh, opposition parties to, to organize and challenge uh, the government. And, and again, you know, the, without an independent judiciary, uh, free civil society, uh, uh, press that is able to hold into account political leaders, a democracy perhaps uh, struggles. Do, have you noticed in your in your work a, a consistent effort in that regard? Yes, absolutely. We are facing on a daily basis with um, the government trying to hindering us. There is also a um, serious, like we can talk about serious issues with redistributing EU funds, with corruption, with, uh, with lack of transparency. And obviously the media freedom is, uh, is also a very big question and concern um, regarding the rule of law, because um, at the moment it is very, very hard to find a media that is not entirely biased for, for the government. There is no really a freedom of media. So, um, so yes, indeed, the government is trying to um, regulate and trying to manipulate um, more and more areas of, of the life of the everyday citizen in Hungary. So it is indeed um, a huge issue. Yes. Uh, Vladimir, if I may come to you, um, both Marcin and Bea have been describing a quite grim uh, situation taking place in Poland and Hungary. It has been quite widely discussed and debated uh, in Brussels, but also in various capitals. And the EU has been considering how to address it. Uh, but also the, there are challenges in, in Serbia, uh, perhaps of similar nature. And um, you and the European movement team in Belgrade have frequently been raising those 
challenges uh, faced by Serbian democracy. But it's not as much uh, noticed, uh, perhaps, uh, on this side of, of Europe. Uh, could you perhaps uh, um, give us a description on what the situation is and if there are any parallels that can be drawn with what's happening in Hungary and in Poland? Thank you, Petros. Thank you, European Movement, for inviting us to participate today. And I must say, if you find the situation in Poland and Hungary grim, and uh, I cannot change that, forward, that that tone coming from Serbia, so using Serbia's example to make it more positive would be uh, uh, a wrong choice. Uh, well, uh, I can start from the beginning of accession negotiations. When we started in 2014, Serbia, by all means, by and by all international watchdog organizations and European Union was considered to be a democratic state with a semi-consolidated democracy, with a fair, uh, with a fair uh, freedom of expression and uh, lacks of la lacking of rule of law that should have been improved over time during accession negotiations. So the idea of accession negotiations is basically to have a country that has certain problems, solve those problems and come to the level of the EU in some let's say, a uh, normal amount of time. Uh, however, in case of Serbia, and like I said, we started as a free state. We lost the free state status according to Freedom House in 2019. We were considered to be semi-consolidated democracy. Now we are cons uh, cons uh, considered to be a hybrid regime going downwards as well. Uh, Reporters Without Borders reduced our ranking for 40 places since 2014, and now we are in the bottom half of the world, uh, of countries in the world. Basically, we take 93rd place uh, in the world on free expression. Uh, the rule of law index uh, dropped up to 97 places. And generally, uh, basically, Transparency International uh, uh, is now putting us on 94th place, 16 places below where we started in 2014. So basically, you see the huge downfall in all elements of what is called the political criteria for accession uh, to, the, to the EU. Uh, according to certain watchdog organizations, Serbia is ranked among 10 countries in the world with the highest drop in democracy uh, in the last 10 years, in the period 2010 and 2020. So basically, we are the front runner, Poland and Hungary being next to us. Uh, we, we are the front runner in this trend uh, of downfall of democracy. And yet, for instance, the European Commission gave the same assessment of Serbia's uh, uh, political criteria in 2020 as it was in 2014. And it even saw some positive trends in 2021. So basically, the problem is that this downfall happened during the accession negotiations. And accession negotiations have a completely opposite uh, purpose, and that is to put the country on the road towards reaching EU standards and not moving away from them, especially not in elements what, that are considered to be essential EU, EU values. And uh, this is the main problem. Uh, the policy of stabilitocracy in the European Union towards the Western Balkans, uh, that basically means leave local autocrats alone as long as they don't make any problems or go to war. So this policy of EU was adopted somewhere in early 2010s. And basically this, uh, this uh, uh, set Serbia and the rest of the Western Balkans on a very wrong course. And instead of having stability, we got captured state in the West, captured states in the in the Western Balkans. Uh, the biggest problem for us as somebody who advocates joining the EU is basically this value uh, value issue because there are two reasons why a country would like to join, especially in Serbia. One is values, why people emigrate from Serbia to the EU because of the values, uh, security, good rule of law, uh, prosperity, and uh, uh, positive expectancy in the future, and of course, the uh, economical development. Problem is that European, Europeanization of a country that was for a lot for a decade uh, equivalent to democratization does not longer does not stand anymore because you can actually uh, progress towards EU membership as in case of Serbia, but at the same time you can regress on all democratic values. And an additional problem is that 20 years ago EU was the only game in town. EU had its values that it was promoting, and EU had. Uh, substantial funds for the Western Balkans. Unfortunately, now we have third parties that have as much money as EU can offer to EU to, to Western Balkan countries, but they don't have any problems with the rule of law, no problems with corruption. They don't raise such issues. 
And uh, at this moment, the EU is seen as somebody who is ready to negotiate about, about its basic values. And the problem of internal uh, issue, internal problems in EU are actually spilling over to the Western Balkans. Now we are suffering because of that. And the problems of rule of law in EU is actually reflecting on us. Because the main issue here is, why should we change anything when you see member states in the EU having the same issues and nothing happens to them? So we can enter the EU like this. This is the common wisdom uh, that government basically is spreading. So basically, we are ready. We are not the shiniest penny in the EU chandelier, but we are not uh, the, we are not the, the, the worst. So at this moment, uh, reports coming from European Union, basically the Commission and some member states are actually making it hard for pro-EU forces in the Western Balkans. This is uh, this is a situation that never occurred before, that activities of EU are actually making it hard for pro-EU forces in a candidate country. We can see what happened in the case of North Macedonia when EU did not meet its commitments. So we had the one reformist government that came with pro-European platform, did very hard work, and yet it did not open accession negotiations. So basically, in order to change the situation in the Balkans, this stabilitocracy approach must stop. Uh, captured states must be named and people behind the state captured should be named as well so we should know the first step towards healing is accepting that you actually have a problem yeah that's um that's quite interesting and like uh, you said the, the the situation is indeed concerning and the effect it has on public support for eu membership is particularly concerning but of course there are many elements here um thank you all all three of you for for the very interesting uh, scene setting, uh, not least because uh, we have now the opportunity to bring in uh, two members of the European Parliament, uh, both of them uh, quite actively engaged uh, on the debate around rule of law and democracy. And um, they had the opportunity to listen to you for, for parts of the discussion. So I will invite them to perhaps joining us. First, we have Brando Benifei, um, who is uh, not just a member of the European Parliament, but he's also a vice president of the European Movement international rando thank you very much for for joining us and for taking the time uh, and with him is uh, Daniel Freund, who is, uh, also a member of the european parliament a close friend of the european movement both here in brussels but also in berlin uh, and equally vocal as brando on questions of uh, rule of law and democracy in the eu uh, maybe i can uh, maybe i can start with you daniel if you don't mind since uh, you, you you came in last on my screen uh, uh, we have been listening to reports from our colleagues in uh, Warsaw, in Budapest, in Belgrade, about the situation in their respective countries and uh, the challenges to democracy at large, the rule of law in particular, but also on civil society. Um, we, we, we've, we've discussed, first of all, Poland and Hungary, and we saw there was uh, a new ruling uh, from the European Court uh, yesterday, I believe, uh, with regards to violence, to exactly this, both for Poland and for Hungary. Uh, perhaps I can start with that. How do you view these uh, uh, court rulings, the recent court rulings that have come forward, that have really put the spotlight on what's going on, first and foremost in Poland, but also in Hungary? Well, thanks, uh, Petros, for, for the invitation on this, uh, this very timely debate. The, the European Court of Justice is now almost on a weekly basis coming uh, with, with further rulings, um, both on, on Poland and Hungary, basically confirming time and again how broken uh, the justice system, uh, the rule of law, in, in parts also democracy, is broken in, in those two member states. And of course, it's, it's good to see how, how vocal the European Court of Justice is on these questions and uh, how, how much the, the judges are trying to um, basically condemn um, a development that is going completely in the wrong direction and that I think we couldn't have really imagined when uh, the, the accession of, of those countries to the European Union happened. But it's also frightening and sad to see how alone the court actually is. I mean, we as the European Parliament were, were vocal on those questions and we're vocal, you know, not just me as a Green and a few Liberals, but it is a very broad majority in the European Parliament from the Conservatives to the very left uh, that supports a more ambitious line uh, on, on these questions. And the group leaders have just this week 
written uh, to Ursula von der Leyen that for us it's out of question now to greenlight the recovery fund money to Poland and Hungary if if there is not change in in the rule of law situation in both countries before any money uh, is is greenlit to those countries. But basically, both from the Commission and, and even more so from the member states, we're, we're lacking uh, the kind of support for the rule of law that would really be necessary. We have since the 1st of January now uh, the rule of law conditionality mechanism. The Commission is refusing to use it so much so that we as Parliament have just filed a lawsuit against the Commission uh, for inactivity on this, something uh, that hasn't really happened that often before and, and being sued um, by the Parliament for inactivity on rule of law, uh, I, I think is is not exactly a badge of honor for for Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, even more devastating, of course, is the situation in the Council, where uh, the situation in Hungary, for example, where Orban is dismantling the rule of law and democracy for eleven years now. And this year, uh, when he introduced the LGBTI law, was the first time that the heads of state and government really discussed the situation in Hungary. They have been ignoring the situation. I mean, they're all aware, but in their in their discussion among themselves, they've been ignoring the situation in Hungary for, for a decade, uh, not wanting to interfere uh, for, I guess, different reasons, uh, political party, family affi affiliation and, and, and others. And this has led to a situation where this rule of law crisis is now spreading, where it is no longer just Hungary, uh, then came Poland, and we see issues in, in other member states, for example, in Slovenia, uh, as well with the appointment of, uh, of the EPO uh, delegated prosecutors and so on. So this, this situation is getting more and more out of control and more difficult, uh, of course, for anyone to, to rein in. So a real rule of law crisis that I would see that we cannot leave the European Court of Justice alone to solve. Yeah, and that, that is actually quite important. We can come back, but perhaps, uh, Brando, you know, you have uh, both in your role as a vice president of the European movement, but also as a member of the European Parliament, been quite vocal on uh, on the situation in Hungary and elsewhere. Uh, following up from what our colleagues in uh, the various uh, member state capitals uh, said, and also Daniel's um, introduction. How do you view this challenge on the rule of law and democracy in the EU? And what do you think could be the consequences of uh, the current situation? Yes, uh, well, I have to say that uh, this is, uh, as was said by my colleague, uh, a really um, hot topic at the moment uh, and a very timely discussion um, and uh, I, I think it's very important that our European movement international of which I'm honored to be vice president uh, takes the time and the effort to bring uh, um, people uh, from various backgrounds to work on uh, on this topic to, to discuss to push I think it's part of our core uh, core mission I would say because rule of law is a foundational element of the integration of the European Union and of Europe in general, thinking also of uh, other uh, institutions like the Council of Europe and, and others. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a matter that reflects a very worrisome and dangerous political crisis that the European Union is undergoing. Um, a, a, a crisis inside uh, um, the Union that is uh, can be even worse than uh, than Brexit if we don't put an, uh, a, a stop to to it. Uh, the, the situation has been deteriorating uh, quickly because of the behavior of, uh, especially of the behavior of two governments, the Hungarian and the Polish one, um, which. Uh, uh, are not the only ones responsible for this situation. In fact, their, uh, their behavior against uh, rule of law and uh, also uh, circumventing the uh, uh, court of justice in various extent, um, in negation of the fundamental rights, in political blackmailing, in attempting to jeopardize media freedom, 
it has been an even uh, the issue of the independence of the justice system. In my opinion, unfortunately, it has gathered support, debate space in all the member states, especially fueled by the anti-European, anti-democracy movements that have been uh, uh, destabilizing uh, the liberal democracy in Europe. In my own country, we have seen forces that have uh, more than 40, at the moment, have around 40% of the popular support, maybe a little less, but around that, that have been uh, um, giving uh, solidarity to the Polish government. Uh, the sovereignists, um, and, and I, I think they must be revealed for what they are, that they want to, to break uh, the foundations of our democracies, which is uh, the uh, uh, rule of law, separation of powers, uh, and respect for fundamental rights based on, uh, on, uh, on our constitutions and on the charter of the European Union on the fundamental rights. So. I think it's uh, it's uh, it's important. It's crucial that we work to stop them, um, but we need political leadership by the EU to pose the crisis from furthering and to re-establish the principle that uh, it is uh, law that governs countries and not this populistic uh, rhetoric. Um, I, I think that. Uh, I mean, I can, I should not get again on the issue of the ECJ developments. They were already mentioned by Daniel, but I want to just um, reiterate that it was very cr crucial. I think that from the Parliament side, we had this letter on the uh, RRF in uh, in Poland uh, that is uh, very clear because um, it's a clear message to our citizens too why there could be governments that can avoid respecting rules that everyone has to abide to and they can just get resources and European support anyway. So this is uh, my uh, take on the situation and I'm convinced that the parliament can play a crucial role. It is uh, playing it and it's, it must use all its instruments, including the the the, the the ju 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 judicial ones to uh, pursue a, a fight that is for the very soul of Europe. Yeah. That, that's actually very, very strong uh, points you raised there, Brandon. I'm glad that you did because this is not just a, a case of uh, challenging the rule of law in one or two member states, but like you said, the other forces across Europe are using this as a rallying cry to promote their own type of. Uh, uh, illiberalism, illiberal democracy, and maybe I can, if I can go back to Marcin and, and Bea, uh, I would like to to take uh, to hear your take on what uh, Daniel and Brando said with regards to that the, the challenge to the European Union as a whole from what's happening in your respective countries. Uh, have you, you know, we've seen efforts for. Uh, uh, these illiberal forces to unite, to come together, both by creating groups in the European Parliament, uh, but also by supporting each other in a way. Uh, is that something that both the PIS government and uh, Fidesz uh, are, are pursuing, these European alliances to, to strengthen their hand and, um, and respond to uh, what the EU might be able to do to curtail their efforts to compromise democracy? And Martin, maybe you can ask you to go first. Yes, yeah, so 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 I I really appreciate uh, the role that uh, European Parliament uh, took and uh, all uh, these resolutions and initiatives and this recent letter also. And still, situation must be very closely monitored because because uh, I am afraid that. Uh, 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 the, 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 this, uh, for example, this recent uh, letter of these uh, five uh, leaders of five groups in the European Parliament, they require that uh, the, the funds to Poland will be released only after implementation of uh, certain measures required by the Court of Justice. But uh, uh, the government, Polish government, is already preparing implementation that will simply make a kind of a smoke screen, you know, that they, they circumvent formally, they will 
the uh, abandon, they, they will liquidate this disciplinary chamber in the Supreme Court. They perhaps will, will restore some judges to, 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 to the service. But at the same time, parallel, so, so formally, they will comply with uh, those requirements formally. And, and perhaps then the commission will decide to release uh, funds and to accept this recovery uh, plan for Poland. But at the same time, for example, they are preparing a great reorganization of all judiciary, 10,000 judges. Uh, the, the appeal court will be called regional court, local court will be called another way. And the constitution allows that in case of reorganization, you can dismiss judges that are not fitting to, to these new reorganized uh, structures. So they will get rid of uh, uh, several judges that, that are issuing independent uh, decisions that, that the government doesn't like. Uh, and secondly, these disciplinary measures will be transferred to other part, other chamber of Supreme Court, but again filled with those politically selected uh, uh, judges to Supreme Court. So they are not we, we wishing you know, to, to uh, genuinely uh, adopt those resolutions of uh, um, Court of Justice and to implement them. Uh, uh, I mean, so, so, so really the challenge is really great. Challenge is really great for Parliament, for European institution. And I am very supportive to the radical measures because if we don't wake up, if you don't wake up, of course, the European Union will uh, stop to be a model for Ukraine, for example. Right now, this is still a dream for Ukrainians to join European Union the, as a camp of values, prosperity, rule of law, security. But if they will see all this uh, uh, tolerance uh, to the countries, uh, to the governments like, like, like Polish, like others, and one, one, one comment about sovereignty, because uh, in Poland, and as I understand also in Italy, in some other countries, it is presented as a defense of solidarity, as a sovereignty, defense of sovereignty of the country. That the judicial system is sovereign and, and we, we cannot allow European institutions to, 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 to mandle, to, 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 to interfere into this. But in Poland, in practice, this is, it, it is also presented in such a way in Poland also, you know, that we are defending Polish sovereignty. But in practice, it is not about the sovereignty. It is about the control of Minister of Justice, who is at the same time Prosecutor General, control over independent judiciary. And this is the real uh, conflict about who is controlling, whether anybody is controlling judiciary, whether prosecutor general can control judiciary, disciplinary judges, etc. And not about sovereignty. So uh, I think uh, also this is a problem of, of attack on media. We didn't talk about this, but 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 at the same time, parallelly, attack on 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 independence of media is, is is going on. This is a separate separate topic, also then becoming dangerous in Poland. Uh, so I am very uh, grateful for European Parliament for all these the, the parliamentarians who really uh, are dedicated because they are not only defending rule of law in Poland, but they are also defending the values of the European Union and and, and the the. the I mean, the, the, the sense of this uh, community, uh, its, its uh, image in, in the world, in, in other countries. Yeah. And I think that's also the, the duality of the challenge here. And maybe I'll, I'll come back to Daniel and Brando before I come to you. Uh, but I, I should say that it's not just a question of uh, how do we do deal with this through judicial means. It's also the narrative that we need to combat, this idea that somehow the EU is attacking Poland or the Polish people, which is not true, of course. Uh, what is the European Parliament and other institutions are doing, they're trying to defend the, the rights and the freedoms of the, of the Polish and the Hungarian people uh, against attempts by certain political uh, regimes. But if, Daniel Brando, if I can ask you to respond a little bit to what uh, Marcin was saying about uh, how the Polish government will try to get around uh, the current efforts by the Commission, uh, the Court and the European Parliament. Daniel, you want to go first? Yeah, what, what I found particularly frightening with that uh, ECJ ruling on the um, compatibility of the Polish constitution with the, uh, with the treaties is that it provoked a bit the opposite 
reaction of what you could have expected. You know, you could have expected that if Poland puts into question the supremacy of EU law, like it hasn't done by been done by any member state uh, before, um, that that there would be a higher willingness of the Commission and also of member states to do something about it. But the exact opposite happened, and I think one crucial role in that was played uh, by the outgoing German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who basically said. Oh, let's um, let's not go too fast on anything. Let's uh, try some dialogue first. At the same time, trying to get that dialogue off the agenda of the European Council meeting on anything related uh, to rule of law questions. But there is a certain group of politicians, clearly, and uh, it seems to be fairly widespread in the Council, to say, you know, don't go against any other member state. Let's th let them do their what they perceive still as something internal. But the legal order of the union and whether EU law applies everywhere and whether it is uh, surveyed by independent courts everywhere is not an internal question. It's not a question of sovereignty and, and what you can do in your own country. Once you have decided to join the union, you have signed up you have signed up to the laws and the treaties of the EU. And we all as EU citizens have to rely on that the national courts under sort of the auspices of the ECJ apply EU law in a uniform manner. And if there is ever a dispute on that, it's the ECJ that's responsible. But then the discourse is that aren't we risking that, that Poland might leave the EU uh, and that we create a similar situation as when we put too much pressure on, uh, on, on the Tories and, and on the Brexiteers and then ultimately they left the Union. I think there's three very important differences uh, between Poland and the UK and why I think there's actually even if we use the financial pressure that there is no risk uh, of Poland deciding to leaving the Union. The first one is the overwhelming public support for EU membership, even now in this situation. Uh, poll after poll showing that they support this. Poll after poll also showing that they actually support the conditionality link between the respect of fundamental values and the paying out of EU funds. Second reason, of course, is uh, where the UK was a large net contributor to the budget, uh, Poland and, and Hungary are respectively both an absolute and then in per capita terms the biggest beneficiaries of, of the EU budget. So it would economically make even less sense uh, than it did for the Brits to, uh, to go out the door. And I think the third reason is Brexit itself. Uh, we all remember that in 2016, at the time of the referendum, there were a number of other crazies uh, that, that wanted to leave the Union, right? There were um, the, the Marine Le Pen's, the Gerd Wilders, uh, and so on, that said, oh, my country will be next to leave the Union. No one is saying that anymore. Uh, even the extreme right-wing uh, groups have sort of shifted their debate, uh, be it, well, maybe still wanting to leave the Euro, but not the Union. Uh, some of them have now switched to, we want to reform the Union from within, have more Europe of nation states or whatever, but no one of them is openly saying we want to leave the union anymore. And I think these three reasons mean that that the risk is is bigger in non-action and in not defending the the, the rights and, and, and also the values of all Europeans in those member states uh, rather than fearing that they might leave the union. Yes, indeed. Uh, Brando, uh, if I may, uh, please uh, respond also to both Daniel, but also Martin's points. Well, uh, many things have been said already that are absolutely uh, uh, also in line with what I think. Um, I, 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 I will have to leave in a few minutes uh, for a meeting, but I want to just add one thing that uh, I try to um, also, uh, when I talk about this, especially looking at what's happening in Poland, when I I talk with uh, other um, with people uh, in uh, and organizations, policymakers from the other countries. I try to also underline the fact that we are not talking just about uh, um, fundamental rights uh, and rule of law that impacts on um, uh, the uh, Polish people, uh, but it's uh, an issue of the integrity of uh, not just an abstract or 
maybe not abstract, but could be felt abstract, um, institutional system of the EU, of the judiciary, of the legal certainty in a general sense. But we are also talking about the day-by-day -day functioning of our economy and society. Because when we lose legal certainty based on the supremacy of the EU law, when the national courts can, uh, with the supports of the political uh, uh, part and also with politicized judiciary, uh, can uh, change the interpretation of the uh, uh, communitarian law based on a purported uh, supremacy of national law that they want to propose, then how can we have a common market? How can we have a common economy in Europe? It's impossible because our rules will not be have any more the certainty of being respected. Rules for very basic economic activity to be respected everywhere. They could be changed based on political leanings. So this is uh, uh, an aspect that needs to be un underlined to uh, show the whole dimension of the problem. And uh, I, I think we will need to, uh, to continue discussing about this and acting like we are uh, doing from the parliament side, but we also need uh, uh, people that are active, like the European movement also in, uh, in the countries involved, to be uh, an important actor to, to, to mobilize a civil society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brando, and uh, thanks for your time. And I think, again, you, you hit the nail on the head, uh, highlighting the, the economic also dimension of uh, the need to have a, a clear clarity on, on the rule of law. Uh, and as you say, exactly because it's so important, it's a cross-party issue. And, and uh, we have, it's, it's encouraging to see the alliance being formed within the European Parliament, encompassing all pro-European forces uh, uh, who have come forward to address this issue. Because clearly, they, this is not just a question of uh, party uh, priorities. It's, it goes across the board. And like you said, Brando, it really affects every aspect of our union. Uh, Bea, maybe I can come briefly back to you, because um, I want to follow up what Marcin was saying. And, um, and also raise that point that both Daniel and Brando made about the, the pan-European nature of the challenge and, and the effort of uh, perhaps um, certain political parties to co opt the support of others in other member states to pursue their agenda. Is that something that you see with Fidesz? There have been a lot of efforts spearheaded by Orban to uh, perhaps cooperate with other like-minded political leaders in other member states. Yes, it's absolutely right. And um, I truly believe that Marcin is right. I absolutely agree with the questions of sovereignty. Orban's government is also putting a really, really huge emphasis on, on keep telling people that sovereignty, we could lose our sovereignty towards the EU law, we should not give full supremacy. Um, but again, what is very um, an interesting question indeed is that whether Orban's government is really using um, normative or legal act against the EU because in fact what we what we experience here in Hungary is that and here I would like to come back just a little bit for Daniel's um, um, issue that he raised about the LGBTQ rights because that is a very very um, good example uh, which could be rolled out to different policies in Hungary how the government actually reacts. Um, the government is, does not explicitly say that we should go against the EU or we should go against EU values, but however, they are trying to shape public opinion in a way that they are using referendums, they are using uh, public questionnaires all the time with, with guided questions where basically people and citizens do not really have a chance to actually um, answer it. So however, um, concerning the LGBT rights, uh, they did not uh, change the law but they are shaping public opinion towards um, towards um, basically to threaten the people and and uh, they are working in a way that's you know raising public tension. Um, LGBTQ rights is just one example. Uh, I think this could be rolled out when it comes to the question of migrants, uh, asylum seekers, when it comes to media freedom, when it comes to freedom of speech. 
So basically, the methods, um, this is a soft democracy and the government is now using methods that are not, um, cannot be 100% um, being attacked by the EU or saying that this is explicitly uh, against EU law. There are certain, however, um, but, but they are not, um, not really implied and implemented in the national law. So, for example, there is another um, example uh, about the administrative courts. Um, recently, there has been a new law um, where the government decided that um, judges, um, who are judges of the administrative courts, they don't need to have judicial um, experience. It is only enough, let's say this is enough, um, if they have public administration experience which is, um, again, a point that is a very, very small one, but it can make a huge impact uh, for the lives of the everyday citizens. And I think that with these methods, with these tools, they are small tools, but indeed the government can um, reach um, very, very uh, big impacts within the society. So unfortunately, um, here sometimes we have the feeling that the things are either black or white, but there is there is not really um, you know gray area. There is not a gray area. I mean that whether you you comply with law or not, but there is not really um, a golden rule. A golden rule would say. Sorry, I cannot hear you now. Microphone malfunction there, but I, I was just saying that that links to the point that Marcin was make. The, the effect or the way public opinion can also be manipulated and uh, the way that things can be presented. Uh, it's it's very it's a big challenge also for the institutions, both for the European Parliament, but also the European Commission. Uh, if I may, before I return to Daniel, uh, I'll come to, to Vladimir a bit because obviously we our attention was uh, on on the EU and member states, specific member states, but also uh, across the EU. But as you said in your introduction, Marcin, we, we see similar, if not uh, worse, uh, occurrences of uh, attacks on civil society, me dependent media, etc., etc., in Serbia too. And uh, and you mentioned at the end the, the effect that has on public opinion and the support for for EU membership. How are you, as as a civil pro-European civil society organization, uh, addressing this, trying to still make the case for EU membership despite the situation you are in? This is a question for me or for Marcin? Yes, yes, rather for you. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, didn't, didn't understand at the beginning. Uh, well, uh, it's, it, it is difficult. It is difficult. Uh, one of the issues is uh, access to media. Actually, in Serbia, we have uh, five uh, TV stations with national frequencies. All five are controlled by the government. We have only one media outlet that is not con uh, serious media outlet that is not controlled by the government. And this uh, media outlet cannot be seen in 50% of the country. So basically, you have a very, very limited, limited way of uh, reaching people. Now, with COVID, it's very difficult to travel around the country. Uh, it's very difficult to talk to people, particularly when you're trying to explain that uh, messages that are, they are getting for nine, last nine years are completely wrong. And they don't, have a, uh, they don't face the reality that we are having some uh, alternate reality. And then it's uh, the ultimate, the, ultimate uh, the issue when you want to raise something is that uh, European Union assessed something as positive or that European Union opened a negotiation chapter. And that is the only proof of, uh, proof of the uh, Serbia succession success. So if we open something, then it's okay. We didn't open a single chapter since December 2019, but yet now that is not even uh, an issue anymore because EU in Serbia is not an issue in public debate. That is one of the biggest problems. Uh, EU as a, as a point that was an election-winning point before 2012, now it is not even an issue. Nobody talks about it. And basically, EU, is, EU accession is just there, you know, like a cherry on top of the cake, like to show that we have pro-European, pro-Western government that is trying to join the EU, but those 
bad people from EU do not allow us to join. So basically, this is the main uh, main text message box that is being sent from all the media under control, and that's basically literally 80% of media are controlled by by the state. And this is the message box they they they, they receive. Uh, the problem is when uh, EU institutions uh, start to send the same messages. Inst like I said at the beginning, we have a huge downfall of all elements of democracy in Serbia. But yet again, for instance, this progress report this year uh, saw uh, progress in numerous areas. But th that progress is limited, even though it's limited, it's marked as limited. Uh, actually stayed on the superficial, on box tick, tick, ticking exercise, on formal formal aspects. For instance, strategy is adopted, but everybody knows in Serbia that this strategy is not going to be implemented. The constitution is being breached, the laws are being breached every day, so why should the one simple strategy? But yet again, you have the ticking box exercise coming from the EU saying that we have made some progress. So it's a very, uh, it's a very big problem. Uh, we have we made analysis. We show that things are not moving in the right direction. Uh, we are having problems with uh, basically the same problems as in European Union, and we see this, the the signs of clear cooperation between political ruling political parties in Serbia and Poland. So basically, Serbia is joining that bloc, not the bloc of the EU. And we openly had a question from our one MEP. Uh, a few few months ago, which kind of European Union Serbia wants to join? Is it a European Union of rule of law or is it the European Union of this other side that we are talking today? Apparently, Serbia wants to join this group, but that's not gonna that is not gonna happen. And uh, when we speak about judiciary, we have pretty much similar similar. Uh, tendencies. We didn't have the rule of law and independent judiciary before. That is the biggest difference. But now EU is asking us to introduce the, the independence of judiciary. Thing is, the government doesn't want to do it. But now we have the exercise of uh, how to disguise that we uh, are not going to give independence to judiciary uh, enough, to disguise it enough, so EU can buy it as an independent judiciary. So this is basically the name of the game. At, at this moment, and it's very difficult to talk to people about it because uh, there was not, we are changing the constitution probably in January to give independence to the judiciary, but in the last five years since this process is going on, there has not been a single uh, uh, debate about it in the media, on the national television. We don't talk about it. So basically all EU related issues are off the table. That's not a topic in Serbia. Indeed. Uh, Daniel, if I can go back to you in the time we have remaining, um, you know, it, it's clear that, especially with recent moves to challenge the, the primacy of EU law over national law, uh, this is becoming very much a debate um, around the, the soul of the, of the European Union and how exactly uh, we will govern it. We are going through the Conference on the Future of Europe exercise now. You are a member of the plenary and also a, of the executive and observer on the executive uh, board of the Conference of the Future of Europe. And uh, you know, the question of democracy and rule of law features quite prominently in that discussion. Uh, how can we make the most of the conference to ensure that we are able to defend? And by we, I mean pro European forces, both in the parliament, but also across civil society in Brussels and in, in the capitals, um, to ensure that the, uh, you know, the rule of law and democracy remains at the core of the European project and those illiberal forces who are trying to uh, hijack uh, certain issues and reform, for a lack of a better term, the EU according to their own image, are defeated. Sometimes I, I wonder if, you know, even, even saying that there is a debate uh, about the supremacy of EU law is not actually giving too much credit to just a few government officials in, in Hungary and Poland uh, that seem to be putting that into question. Because as, as far as I know, all member states have signed up to the treaties. The treaties mention the ever closed union as, you know, in the, in the, in the preamble. And I mean, I, I was so shocked when the Polish prime minister came to, to the parliament prem, uh, plenary and then basically talked of a creeping revolution 
whereby uh, we're, we're somehow undermining the sovereignty of member states. I call that creeping revolution ever closer union, and it has been one of the the, the, the principles on which we have been building, extending and deepening the European Union over the past uh, 60, 70 years. And, and reinterpreting history like that, I, I think is really quite dangerous. And, and saying now that this is some, some secret conspiracy that, uh, that is going against the interest of member states. And I also haven't seen actually any member state, even Poland and Hungary so far, have not submitted any any suggestions to alter the treaties and to to take out for example if they don't like the ever closer union well it is free to each member state to come with their uh, amendment proposals to the treaties convince uh, unanimously uh, the the other governments the european parliament the national parliaments that would need to ratify uh, to make that change to the union but as long as that change isn't made the current treaties apply and um so, so, so much for the is is the ever close union or the supremacy of EU law in in that sense really in, put into question in in the union. Um, but of course, I would like to use the conference for quite the opposite of what someone like Morawiecki or Orban have in mind. And I want the next step of of integration. I uh, would with delight. Uh, sign off on on that provision that we had in the constitutional treaty that said it very clearly, black on white, uh, EU law uh, is you know ranked higher in the legal order than the national law, um, which which was struck out of the um, of the Lisbon Treaty. Why not bring that back and and put this question uh, to bed once and for all? But what we also see in the conference is that those enemies of the union and of further integration might very well uh, capture the conference and basically prevent any kind of meaningful outcome. You know, we already see what happens now that uh, that Slovenia uh, is one of the co-chairs in the executive board. We have basically resorted to not meeting in the executive board uh, till the end of the year, as far as I understand, because uh, Slovenia has been more or less blocking pretty much everything uh, that, that was on the agenda. Um, Judith Varga, as the Hungarian justice minister, already sits in the executive board as an observer. Uh, and has been participating in the debates as well. And, you know, we still don't know how decision-making in the conference at the end will really work. Will there be votes in the in the working groups? Will there be votes in the plenary that, you know, on the different proposals will actually decide what, what goes into the final conclusions of the conference or not? And if there is votes, and if in the council pillar they decide we're going to do everything on unanimity and we're not going to outvote certain governments, uh, well, this might very well give the power to, to Poland, Hungary, Slovenia or others to just block any proposal uh, that they don't like or that they deem too uh, federalist or, or, or whatever. So, so that is obviously the, the, the big obstacle that we somehow need to overcome uh, in this conference. And unfortunately, so far, the public attention to the whole process is, is so little that we, we we haven't managed to break out of uh, of of the you know the the euro enthusiast bubble in that sense and my proposal was always you know as much as i disagree with his ideas but the hungarian government is the only government that i'm aware of so far that has come with concrete proposals on the future of europe and indeed they have published them in newspapers across the european union so why don't we invite viktor orban to present his ludicrous ideas, including to abolish, in a way, the European Parliament, present them, and then all those of us that have very different ideas for the future of Europe can, uh, you know, come with our ideas. But then at least we have the public attention that I think this process needs uh, to succeed in the end. Indeed, indeed. No, that, that would make a very interesting plenary discussion, and uh, obviously this is the strength of democracy, having uh, disagreements. Uh, Perhaps we can close the discussion with going back to our colleagues in, um, from the civil society in the various countries. And, uh, Bea, you know, there is an election coming uh, in Hungary. You mentioned this briefly, and, and a coalition of opposition parties is putting forward a joint candidate. Uh, what do you think um, are the perspectives for the next six to 12 months in, in Hungary, if you could look in a crystal ball and predict the future maybe for us? 
Well, um, I think absolutely nobody can tell us um, what's going to happen at the end. Um, during the pre-election campaign, what we had, um, so basically the idea was to put together one common candidate from the opposition um, to stand and basically fight with Orban uh, during the upcoming elections. And in the very last minute, they changed this person, and now we have somebody new. Um, I think this was a brilliant step in regards that um, the actual government and Fidesz started to attack the opposition um, party and started to attack this very man who is um, actually the mayor of Budapest. He was the candidate of the joint opposition. Uh, and um, we could hear everywhere the media was full with uh, with conspiracy theories um, saying that who um, the mayor is cooperating with, why uh, people should not vote for him. And in the very last minute, they changed the personality and put a new person there. Um, Polls say now that he has a, a, a good chance in winning, uh, and actually now um, he is more supported than Orban. Uh, but honestly, nobody knows what will come up in the in the upcoming months. This is a very very interesting and very um, well, let's say, tensioned um, period that is going to do to to come. Uh, everybody is very very interested in the strategy of the government. Um, we will see. Most possibly, it will not be very smooth, that I, I, I can tell. Martin, we've also seen that uh, Donald Tusk has made the return to Polish uh, uh, politics, and uh, there are similar efforts also, I think, in Poland, the, the various opposition parties to, to cooperate. Um, what do you foresee in the, for the next few months, uh, both in the political domain, but also in relations with the European Union? So uh, I, I think that, uh, first of all, the Polish opposition is unfortunately divided and I'm afraid that uh, they might be not able to make a joint uh, front. For example, uh, uh, Farmers Party that is in opposition uh, is not going to be on the same list as uh, uh, very liberal parties demanding uh, LGBT marriages, uh, sanctions, and, and this kind of things, because they are afraid that they are going to lose their electorate. Uh, uh, and there are some other problems. So, uh, Donald Tusk, of course, is a value added, uh, but uh, it might be not enough because the election rules are such that if uh, uh, law and justice takes about uh, 35 40 percent of votes, they can have majority 50 percent of. Uh, uh, deputies in the parliament, uh, uh, and only united opposition can, can somehow overcome this. This is one comment. Another comment, I fully uh, share the view uh, by um, Daniel that Poland will not leave European Union. I would say somehow again the opposite. If this uh, uh, economic financial pressure is lifted, if uh, uh, EU is buying uh, some re window dressing, you know, some formal changes uh, regarding wow. disciplinary chamber, etc. And uh, money are released, it will be announced as a great triumph of, 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 of the policy that EU is with us, you, you, EU accept us, there is no problem anymore, etc. So, so it will add a lot of steam to, to the government uh, camp. I would rather say that uh, all um, European uh, Justice Court, uh, European Human Rights Court, all their rulings should be implemented. And the, the key issue is National Council of Judiciary. One of the key issues is National Council of Judiciary that is uh, promoting judges. Mm -hmm. And last point I would like to make that uh, pro-European NGOs, civil society, are not getting sufficient support because anti-European or Euro Eurosceptical organizations are financed by government, are financed by, by state uh, uh, enterprises, mm, are, are even sometimes financed by, by, from, from European uh, resources, European funds. Whereas the pro-European uh, civil uh, society organizations that are mm, watching, uh, preparing reports, organizing demonstrations, informing the public about the situation, making analysis, they are not getting sufficient support, I would say, from from EU funds, uh, this should be somehow revised and, and, and better monitored.
Okay. No, that, that's a very strong point. And I think the shrinking civic space across Europe is indeed a, a challenge. And uh, the support that we require to do our job is, is, uh, is very important. And, and again, that's something the Parliament has always been vocal uh, about, both in, term, in terms of the principle of the thing, having a healthy and strong civil society, but also the practical aspect of, of funding. But maybe one last point, we have a few more minutes. Uh, Vladimir, I can come back to you. Uh, how do you see the prospects of, uh, of Serbia vis-a-vis -vis its uh, European trajectory, uh, but also the prospect of civil society in Serbia, following up a little bit on what Marcin said about the challenges faced there? I think your microphone is off. Yeah, I know, I realize that. Well, challenges for civil society in Serbia are the same as what I've heard in Poland, the same problem of financing, the uh, the same issues you, that you cannot uh, access media and uh, things like that. And of course, uh, civil society is under attack by the government. Last year, we have a huge uh, problem when the government uh, illegally i must i must add and it was confirmed by united nations later illegally started the financial financial investigation against uh civil society targeted civil society individuals and media who are basically uh not pro-governmental so we have a huge problem with that uh when we speak about perspectives of serbia i see them as bleak i don't see serbia like this being organized like this being run like this joining the eu i don't see that happening for a very very good reason uh majority of eu member states the, the very discussion today we had was about the rule of law in hungary and and poland and how to defend eu values against uh, developments in Hungary and Poland. And if we join, organized like this, we would actually join the club with Hungary and Poland. So I don't see it politically possible for EU member states and for political forces who are majority in the, par in the European Union on the level of member states and parliament, European parliament, that they would allow such a country to join the EU and actually reinforce the bloc with Hungary and, and Poland. So I don't see that possible. I don't see uh huge movements towards eu membership in a, in a recent uh, in in the near future particularly not with this political uh political climate in serbia and serbia being organized like this thank you um, and daniel maybe the last word uh, to you uh, what should we expect next um, the, uh, like you said the european parliament has taken legal action against the commission for its uh, inaction on on this particular issue, what should we expect next from the European Parliament in this domain? Well, I I don't think that um, there's much for for us to do at this stage. I mean, we'll continue to follow that question, continue to to put pressure both on the Commission and as much as we can on on member states. But the ball is really in the court of the European Commission. Mm -hmm. Um, I would expect that the ruling of the ECJ on that um, lawsuit by Poland and Hungary against the rule of law conditionality will well, maybe still come in December, otherwise in January. And as soon as that ruling is there, I mean, even the most hesitant ones in the council, uh, you know, their conditions are fulfilled to use the rule of law conditionality. And then I, I would very much hope and and we will continue to to put pressure on the commission to use it i mean i i know from commissioner han that the uh, the legal notice necessary to send to the hungarian and polish governments is is ready it's it's in the drawer it's good to be sent so i would hope that latest when that court ruling is there they'll actually do it uh, and trigger the the rule of law conditionality mechanism for 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 those two two countries i think that's sort of the next step that that i would expect and that i i hope that it's the next step and that in the meantime the european commission does not green light uh, the recovery funds uh, for for poland and hungary because that would be completely the wrong signal in the in the current situation well, uh, we could be we could talk for the on this for for a while, and certainly we're going to come back to it. But I would like to thank you all for for joining us, both uh, those members of Parliament that were with us, but also the uh, 
uh, activists and campaigners uh, from around Europe. And, uh, you know, the, this is something that is very important for the European movement and, uh, and it's very important for many Europeans. And I think we, we all need to cooperate here across uh, national border, across political lines to ensure that the core values or that the European Union is built upon are defended and strengthened. So uh, visit our website, europeanmovement.eu, to see the work that we are doing in these areas. Uh, engage with your the European movements in your countries, whether you're in Poland, in Hungary, or anywhere else. Uh, and first and foremost, you know, make your voice heard. And um, we will return to that subject. So a big thank you to all of you for, for joining us today, especially our speakers for giving us the time. And uh, we will be in touch again soon. Have a good afternoon. Bye.